but very significant. Daniel has the experience of the collapse of Israel, yeah, the loss of their covenantal blessing from God, yeah, and the fact that God whistles up a nation, the way Moses talked about, yeah, whistles up a nation to come and teach Israel a lesson. And the lesson is to drive them out of the benefits of the covenant which they are forsaking. And so they lose their land. And they're carted off into captivity to set up another cycle of God's rescue and deliverance. And off they go into Babylonia. And Daniel is one of the young Jews whom the king of Babylon wants to have trained and developed. You know, those ancient uh, conquerors believed in the necessity of having an understanding of the people they were conquering. Yeah? And so here's Nebuchadnezzar taking a group of young Jews who are in some ways outstanding examples of Jewish life and character. And he wants them trained to be consultants to him in his administration of empire. Now we're much more familiar with it in the terms of the Roman occupation of, of Palestine, of moving in to subject the Jewish people to being overrun by a foreign nation. A nation whom they want to understand. And there's a preliminary deal done between the Roman authorities and a very willing Jewish family, the Herods, to enter into a cooperative deal with the Romans that will provide the Romans with a way of mediating their, role, role, their rule into handling the Jewish people. And so Herod becomes a puppet ruler. Yeah? Yeah, it, Rome pulls the strings on Herod. Yeah? But because of his deal with Rome, he's got an authority which the Jews themselves can't ignore. Yeah? And I say it's a family because there are three different Herods mentioned in the history covered by the Gospels. Yeah, so it's a familiar pattern, yeah? You've got to understand the people that you're ruling. You need to understand the way their culture shapes their thinking and conditions their behavior. And so there's an historical connection between Revelation, which is instruction for God's people going out into a world and understanding that world. And uh, Daniel, with his connection of having experienced the collapse of Israel, it's over two centuries since the collapse of David's kingdom as such, and now here he is amongst con conquering nations who set up empires and he's getting a glimpse of what goes on within empires yeah, that corrupt them and will bring about their collapse. God shows him, gives him a vision 
of a succession of collapsing nations and empires. Yeah? Empires are built out of putting together conquered nations. Yeah? That's what empires are about. And evil can get into empires and collapse them. <coughs> yeah. Paul, writing to the Christians in Rome, in Romans 1, starts to tell, warn the Christians about the corruption of relationships between people. Once they lose sight of God and see a person's relationship to God, they are liable to corrupt their relationships in ways that will finally collapse an empire. We in New Zealand are in a very dangerous state at the moment. There are enough indications of forgetfulness of God, total ignorance of God, no concern about God, in the conduct of personal relationships. And our relationships are presenting a picture of more and greater corruption. Yeah. A prelude to the collapse of a society. Yeah. So, there's a connection between the vision given to Daniel as he begins the experience of domination by an empire. God extends his view. That holy man who daily from his window at the top of his apartment opens it and looks toward Jerusalem, wondering and praying about the future of kingdom in Israel. Yeah? The same theme that's on the hearts of the disciples in Acts chapter 1. Wondering about having been banished into the world of empires. God showing him how those empires and the succession of empires are going to collapse. The Babylonians are going to be pushed out of power by the Medes and the Persians. And the Medes and Persians are going to be pushed out of power by the sudden emergence of the Greek conquerors under Alexander the Great. The man who, in Revelation, yeah, is seen to be the ram whose feet hardly touched the ground. So swift is the spread of the Greek Empire. But fairly swiftly is it also overtaken and uh, extinguished by the Romans. And, uh, and God shows Daniel the essential spiritual character of these empires. Yeah. It's the spiritual character that's at the heart of a collapse. It's not their physical power. Which is why God says to us, don't think that the kingdom, my kingdom, is to be established by might and power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Yeah. And by the life you live, by experiencing my spirit, that's what's going to establish my kingdom. And the declaration about it at the birth of Jesus was that once it's established, it will never.
collapse. And Daniel is given the vision of how the kingdom is going to get underway. He sees the statue of the empires in descending quality from gold to silver to bronze to iron to clay. The descending quality of empires. And in the distance, while he views that huge statue, in the distance he sees a foundation stone cast loose out of a mountain. The mountain, mountains in, in Scripture, represent enduring things that God raises up. Men raise up all sorts of things that don't last. The Old Testament prophets and the celebration of the relationship with God is about this eternal God and His enduring works. And David says, Oh God, that you would establish my works the way you established them. With the permanence of the mountains. Yeah? Raise up a work in Israel, says David, that will last, that will endure. Well, he's only elaborating on the quest of the patriarchs of Israel, isn't he? The Hebrew patriarchs who living on the borderlands yeah, of other countries in that fringe between their lands and the desert who would move with their flocks and herds eating out the pasture in that no man's land between other people's countries and the wastelands, the desert lands, that they didn't own and occupy. And so they began to get a great experience of how other countries lived and how they ran. And the patriarchs were familiar with collapse and change, impermanence, and they began a quest for a city. Please understand, it doesn't just mean a, a city as a place. In the old world, it had the meaning of also a system. A city was a place where a large group of people had congregated to live and required a system to govern their life. <coughs> Yeah. Take the example of Greece. In the time of Philip of Macedon, uh, uh, Alexander the Great's father, Greece was a country of cities where every city followed a different system for running its people, for governing its society. And Philip of Macedon developed a system in Macedon that he felt ought to apply to the whole of Greece. He saw the opportunity to amalgamate Greece into one powerful people living by the same system. And when he succeeded in bringing all of the Greek cities under the system that ruled Macedon, his son Alexander saw the opportunity to make this unified Greece a platform for going out into the world and establishing a Greek empire. Yeah. That's what we're looking at. And Daniel sees how God out of the collapse of empires is going to attract and collect, if you like, the human debris of empires that have collapsed, going to cohere them into an allegiance around a foundation stone cast loose out of Israel, yeah, 
rolling across the plains of history yeah. and encountering in the time of the collapse of this succession of Babylon, Medo-Persian, Greek and Roman Empire. At that period, there's going to be an impact of the foundation stone of God's kingdom with those collapsing empires. Notice, please, that the vision given to Daniel is historically accurate because that final empire is on two legs. Yeah? And we'll come across in Revelation how indeed that Roman Empire splits into two empires, the Eastern Empire and the Western Empire. Western Empire, capital in Rome. Eastern Empire, capital in Constantinople. Constantine, the first Christian Caesar of Rome. Yeah? Under him the empire splits into two. Do you realize that that doesn't happen until the year 330? Yeah. And we're going to pick up and read the messages to churches at the end of the first century. Two and a quarter centuries before that prophecy shown to Daniel actually becomes a reality. God says in the Old Testament, you'll always know prophets that I send. If they come from me, the message I give them to deliver will come true. God says, that's the seal of my authenticity on a prophet. Yeah? You don't have to worry about prophets and what they say. Unless there's evidence that they come from me. Because what they say won't come true. We're going to find out, aren't we, before we finish in Revelation, that we're talking about a world in which there's a huge amount of false prophecy deceiving the people about the future and what's going to happen. Yeah? God says, I'll tell you the truth. Yeah? <coughs> you listen to the quality of truth that Moses gives to Israel. Just in that chapter I started to read. You say, listen to the way he's talking to them. The truth he's giving to them. But it's the same truth about Jesus as a prophet. When he challenges the scribes and Pharisees. Yeah? Or John the Baptist when he says, you people coming to repentance, you vipers, who told you to flee from the fire that's coming? The way snakes flee before an approaching fire. Yeah? Is he trying to become the flavor of the month? Certainly not. He's telling the truth as God gives it to him to deliver. Yeah? Brutal truth. Jesus said, blessed are you if you're not offended by the truth that I have to give you. Yeah. <coughs> yes, so there's that historical connection with, um, with Daniel the prophet and with empires and kingdoms and collapse. And the vision finishes on that vision of God's kingdom and how it's going to begun, begin and impact the nations. I don't want you, however, to miss 
the instruction given to Daniel that he's being given a vision that leaps forward historically to a period to which the vision applies but because of the lack of the historical experience of what the vision is recording it can be seriously misunderstood and so Daniel is told lock it up until the time when the events that God is showing you will actually have become historically real and people will understand the application of the vision to the actual historical events. Now I find that the Christian church has been inclined to be a bit influenced like that and to regard Revelation as a vision that perhaps needs locking up, especially until after the Lord returns, in which case all the guidance of that vision is being set aside by the church. Yeah? Yes? Instead of it being guidance to arrive at the return of the Lord, yeah? There are people disregarding it and saying, oh, it's stuff that's going to start happening once he returns. I'm going to propose to you and trust that you will see it today in the big picture that that is certainly not the case. Once the Lord returns, he'll guide his people through the experience of kingdom. We need the guidance of the scriptures, uh, the recording of that vision, to get us to the point where the Lord can return. Mm. Now that raises for me another of the historical precedents concerning Revelation. And that is the reference to the kingdom of David. The the high point of Israel's spiritual experience and their experience as a people amongst the nations. Yeah? When they earned the respect of surrounding nations so that even a foreign queen comes visiting David's successor, his son Solomon, to find out what is it that ticks with you people? What's the spiritual secret of your people? I want to know what your temple represents. Yeah? Well, as Christians, we haven't been terribly successful in bringing the world to find out what makes us tick. Yeah? And why life in relationship with God can become so fulfillingly successful. Yeah? And I'm not talking materialism. which we'll confront in chapter 3. So there's a historical connection with kingdom. And the kingdom under Saul, who was not God's choice of a ruler, God had his anointed waiting in the wings for the collapse that would enable him to take the throne. Revelation is going to teach us about the collapse of a world that will be a prelude to that world becoming ready to receive the king whom God has anointed. And there is the historical 
association of how it's David's followers. Yeah. Dissatisfied with Saul's rule and the system, his way of running God's people. Leave, pull out from the system and go out to, to join with the anointed man of God in the, in the wilderness. And they get around him and obey him and get built up into a company of followers who later become the great men of his kingdom. And they are the ones who ready the Israel of Saul to accept David as the anointed king. It's their exploits in support of David, in obedience to his training and rule, that lead the people to say, Look at the success under Saul. Yeah, we had victories, you know, of, of slaying a thousand. Look at the followers of this man. Their successes, they slay tens of thousands. The magnitude, yeah. I'm not emphasizing the, the, the success of the Saul. Because it's the one issue that God takes up with David and says it's that reliance on the sword that has to disqualify you for building my temple. You may gather the materials, but I can't sanction that you build it. Otherwise, I'm endorsing the bloodshed that has led to the establishing of kingdom. I want to take my people beyond that. Yeah. Yes. Look, I could, I tend, I'm sorry, John, I tend to disregard my, even my own organization obsessions. <laughs> because once I get on this theme, I'm so hard to stop. <laughs> <laughs> Shall we take a five minute break just to let you catch up? Uh, yes. <laughs> Just a word of prayer. Our loving Lord, as we pick up the vision that you delivered to John, having received it from God your Father, we pray that our words about it and the meditations of our hearts upon that word may be acceptable to you, dear Lord. And we ask that you will ask Father to give his angels charge concerning our meeting here today and that what happens here may indeed be a case of a planting by the kingdom of heaven of a mustard seed upon the earth that will grow to have significance for your kingdom. We have to leave it in your hands and pray that you will so bless us that there will be true results for your kingdom out of what is planted to germinate today. Now, Lord, let's get into your vision. 
and guide us as we think about it. In your name we ask it. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ. The disclosure, the vision of disclosure which God gave him to show to his bond servants. What is it that bonds the servants of Jesus Christ? The thing that bonds us is the bond of an experience of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit who applies the salvation of Jesus Christ to us as individuals. The Holy Spirit promised to become the indweller who by that indwelling would inscribe our hearts so that from the heart we respected and lived in righteousness. The obedience to the law that governs fellowship and partnership with God. Here's a vision and it's carried to John by his angel. <laughs> Jesus in the upper room spoke about the Holy Spirit of God by whom he had had the remarkable life that he had and made the remarkable impact on mankind that he did. He claimed that it was because he knew, he saw what his father was doing and he went along with it and worked in conjunction with his father. And that what he taught, the extraordinary teaching on righteousness that Jesus Christ gave, was taught him by the Holy Spirit. Yeah? I hear what the Lord is saying. He's going to insist that the great thing about churches is that they listen to and hear what the Spirit of God says to them. Otherwise, they'll never fulfill the role that they are appointed to fulfill. Never. And John testifies to this disclosure being the Word of God as testified or witnessed to it by Jesus Christ. And blessed, therefore blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy. You see, in those days, 